John Updike is here since the release of his first novel in 1959. He has published more than 50 books, as well as essays, reviews, poetry, short stories, and book reviews. Along the way, he's won numerous awards, including two Pulitzers and a National Book Award. His new novel is called Seek My Face. I am pleased to have John Updike back at this table. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, Psalm 27, you speak in my heart and say, seek my face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. That's the title. Nicely read. <laughs> uh, um, yes, uh, with the idea that we all, or many of us at least, are seeking his face somewhere, and that uh, the pursuit of art uh, is one way to seek his face. And my heroine is a Quaker-born Philadelphia girl who... Um, Sub sublimates her religious training into an ardent desire to be an artist. She actually marries artists, but is herself one, and by the end of the book has emerged into her own style. Let me get right at it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Jackson me. Pollock is here. <laughs> there is the notion that Pollock sort of pervades this, and also Lee Krasner, who was Pollock's wife. Uh, we have done an hour of a program on Pollock on this program because of Kirk Barnado, the great curator at MoMA at the time. Uh, what did you? What were you about here? Well, you know, I saw that show that B B Barnado uh, uh, cur curated, curated, and uh, it, what struck me as I walked through it was this uh, <coughs> muddy, tangled, rather displeasing early stuff. A lot of it. What a struggle! What a struggle he made you feel painting is and uh, this kind of surrealist murk mixed up with the Mexican muralists. And then in the late 40s, you get this sunburst of marvelous dribble paintings, which are so radiant and exciting and beautiful, beautiful. So you get this burst of beauty, and then you get a rather rapid decline and <clears throat> early death. So it's a dramatic life, and you can see why other people are interested in telling it. I had no interest in telling it again exactly. Uh, so my hero is not called Pollock, he's called what? Zach McCoy, right? right, right. right. Zach McCoy, and I think McCoy was Pollock's actual. And Lee Crash is called Hope. Uh, right, and the, I cannot deny that Zach McCoy is very like uh, Jackson Pollock. But, but uh, not totally, there not are differences. To Thank you, yeah. well, you notice. It's yeah. fiction after all, exactly. fiction, and uh, certainly Lee Kr Kr Krasner uh, was a much less um, demure and proper um, the woman than my heroine, who is a Quaker yeah. wasp and so on, and who uh, lives on. Uh, Krasner kind of uh, died with him, at least she never remarried. Right. Uh, she kept the house as kind of a museum, lived in it. But, you know, she lived, but my thought, as I tried to remember what made me want to write this book, it was something about, suppose Lee Krasner hadn't stopped, suppose she'd gone on, and so on. Two characters in here, both females. Young reporter comes to interview. True. You have said you had to have female characters. It couldn't be male characters. <coughs> Um, or something to that effect. <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You help me. No, certainly I always saw this as two women. And I saw the central situation as that of an interview. Uh, and I've given a lot of interviews. I mean, it seems to me a lot. Maybe not as many as I could have. But You've given a lot to me. I've given a lot to you. And as with you, you get a relationship, right? You get a kind of uh, love begins to kindle. Right. You put two people, especially two women, in the same room all day and things will slowly start to happen, was my theory. And they had to talk about something, so that's why Hope is a artist and a witness to the great American move in the 40s and 50s right, right. and to the international stage for the first time we were world leaders in art. Uh, at any rate, uh, yes, C Catherine is the young woman's name, and she was she's unknown to Hope and kind of unknown to me when she walks in. She never becomes terribly real. Uh, but real enough, let's hope, uh, and real, real enough so that uh, Hope spills everything she knows, everything she feels to her eventually after being somewhat reserved. That's, that's the way you interviewers are, of course. In the end, in the end, you're trying to <laughs> coax stuff out of this, and then this torrent, torrent comes out and you can't stop us. Yeah. I, I found some interesting quotes, and in of which you were, and I want you to just remark about them. 
Philip Roth, Updike, Mailer, and Bella were all together on the great ride. They were there when fiction mattered, and fiction mattered in part because they were there. Only the very thing that made these artists avatars of the self-seeking liberation culture is now their unmaking. Not because we as a culture have ceased to focus upon ourselves, but because they have, as writers, have fallen victim to the law of diminishing returns. The self, however grandiose, is finite. The walls, the wells dry up. That's a sad passage and very eloquent, isn't it? Uh, did Sven Burkitz yes, write that? Yes, he did. Um, he's a bright guy. One wouldn't want to argue with him. Um, and maybe it's all true, but, you know, so what? I'm stuck with being me, and I'm still alive, and I still <laughs> like to write, and I still think I might find some other things to say. So, uh, but, yeah, the exploration of the self, uh, I never believed that myself was that interesting, but it was sort of all I had. These are two women who do not have my career. I mean, I am trying and have tried to stretch stretch my imagination a bit. But in the end, yes, you, you have to kind of begin in the self because that's where the hot spots are. That's what really interests you. That's your song to sing. And then yeah. being a fiction writer, you try to extend it somewhat to include the rest of humanity and make it more general of interest because in the end, you're not that interesting. You're interesting only in that you are an index to human experience. Yeah. What is interesting about you, too, though, I mean, do you think there is a law of diminishing returns here? I mean, do you think that you are less good, less... You'd hate to admit that. Certainly on the Charlie Rose show would be a very poor place to confide <laughs> it to anybody. Uh, I'm not as full of material as I was when I came out of Pennsylvania and discovered that I could sell uh, words. I had uh, 22 years of experience, uh, impressions, uh, mm. to spill. And I have kind of written those through. I've been a steady, plotting kind of writer. Uh, so it's not so easy. You don't have that full of material thing. And if I were to stop writing entirely, uh, Sven Burkitz is right, the world would not long grieve. But I would uh, grieve. And uh, I think in some ways I'm a better writer than I was. But uh, you can't, the kind of energy and innocent hopefulness uh, full of himself that a young writer has is hard to hard to top in the way all the cr crudities and all the innocence get carried along with your mm. own urgency. In what ways do you think you're better? Well, I've... Because you have a deeper well to draw on? I've known more people and had more experience and I have the uh, uh, the unegocentric perspective of uh, elderliness to, to, to uh, give me, I hope, a certain uh, wide-ranging calm look mm. at things but uh, I wouldn't sell short uh, the need to be excited by by what you're, you're trying to say I, I did get excited in this in this book I was excited by the art by the history it contains in distorted form but also mm. I I was excited by the way the women began to mm. connect it's okay and it's, it's equally good and powerful as anything else you do to use the, as Tolstoy did with the war, Napoleon. That's right, Napoleon, the real Napoleon. Well, I guess uh, Jackson Pollock was my uh, Napoleon. Um, I haven't taken the task with uh, leaning so closely upon the actual facts, uh, although I did vary them a bit, and of course, couldn't get them all in. A very good biography of Pollock was written maybe 10, 15 years ago which I read. If you're going to write about a Pollock-like artist, it's very hard not to make him Jackson Pollock, really, no. uh, basically, and to try to hide that would just involve me in a lot of uh, uh, unnecessary um, in ingenuity. Right. Uh, uh, as the book goes on, uh, once it leaves, I saw the facts as kind of a, a flower pot that I was growing a flower out of, and the flower becomes more fictional as we go along, and that the artists cease to be, uh, you can say, he's, uh, um, he's Barnett Newman, and he, right. well, you use characters he's with names, which are, and, yeah, well, yeah and then which are kind of anagrams. They are kind of anagrams, yes, yeah. They are. So it's kind of a joke between people that know. I'm saying, okay, yes, these, yeah, these this, are the guys. This is my I notion am, of the New York school. And of, I am and drawing on them. Yeah. yeah. I'm creating characters. Yeah, but I, then I wanted to go beyond it and really write about hope, hope the, hope the idealist from oh, uh, Philadelphia and, and how her whole life has uh, led her to this 
quiet moment in old age when she can, is kind of herself at the canvas. She's painting the way she should have been painting maybe all along, but she had to live a life to get there. Uh, is that sort of, what's the story you, what, you are writing about this great, this interesting event in which a young interviewer comes to interview Hope at the end of her life. Uh, but what's, what are you really writing about? Are you, uh, you know? <laughs> I'm trying to write, A, about the experience of being uh, old and being approached by a young and vital person to talk about yourself. Uh, in other words, there, you still have some business with the world left to conduct. I wanted to, to write about this moment in American art that she witnessed when the New York School uh, yeah, right. uh, wowed, the, people the, we just wowed the world, wowed the world, and uh, uh, was witness to a kind of idealism and passion that I don't think is present in any of the arts uh, now. Uh, uh, there as, is no question about that. As a young writer living in New York, I used to go up to, to MoMA and just walk around and kind of inhale the, the feeling, the colors, the look, the, the daring of it all, and the comedy of it, and the boldness. And I thought, there must be a way to do this in print, kind of. And so it even rubbed off on yeah. me, even though I wasn't in the same field. And. Uh, I think I think it's hard to see that art became with pop it became irony and it was very amusing and good irony but we're still stuck with the irony without that uh, that bardic feeling you had of pop of wanting to say yes this is a Coca-Cola bottle isn't it grand isn't it beautiful to have a Campbell's soup can yeah you don't get that now you don't know what they're saying why not I don't know I don't know uh, the I'm coming and going of energy in the arts is a very mysterious thing sure uh, there was a lot of energy bottled up in America, I think, uh, by the Depression and the war, which mm. was able to burst forth in the 40s and 50s. Because it was a magical time. It was fun to be, fun to be youngish then. Yeah. It wasn't for a number of reasons. And these people were so, uh, were so wide. And uh, uh, there was one passage I was thinking and of I reading. I want you to read it, too, uh, well, and, and I have a question for you, too. It's hardly... Uh, may be worth reading, but when I did my research, I was struck by the extravagance of some of these remarks. So I imagine the conversation in which somebody like Clifford Still is holding forth in the Cedar Bar, and he talks about uh, something uh, coming up to the toenail of the sublime, and uh, Myrtle Strunk, who's married to another imaginary artist, said, my goodness, Myrtle Strunk had to exclaim, sitting wedged against her husband, the toenail of the sublime. Jarl, his name is Jarl Anders. Jarl, how high would you say you have risen? The ankle? The kneecap? You mean to mock, he stated, his torso as rigid as the dark, near-abstract shaman figures prominent in his work. But I will repay your discourtesy with an honest answer. Since 1941, I date the year precisely as more momentous than any puffed-up events at Pearl Harbor. Space and the figure in my canvas Canvases have been resolved into a total psychic entity, freeing me from the limitations of each, yet fusing into an instrument bounded only by the limits of my energy and intuition. My feeling of freedom is now absolute and infinitely exhilarating. A single stroke of paint, my mocking myrtle, a single stroke backed by a mind that understands its potency and implications can restore to man the freedom lost in 20 centuries of apology and pictorial devices for subjugation. Imagination no longer fettered by the laws of fear becomes as one with vision. The act, intrinsic and absolute, becomes its meaning and the bearer of its passion. I didn't make that up. That was taken pretty much from things that uh, uh, he said, Clifford Still. He was maybe the most grandiose of them all, but there was a grandiosity in their ambition, in their sense of themselves as being creators of a historic moment. Uh, they were innocent in a way. It was an in, in, innocent sort of sweet yeah. thing to feel that. People frequently ask me, who is it that you most want to interview that you haven't? It comes to me. And, and on any list of five for me is Jasper Johns. I try hard. And so far, he says... You've not succeeded not in, succeeded. in no. wooing Jasper Johns. Not yet, but I hope springs eternal in my mind, because I am going to Paris soon for a second conversation with Henri Cartier-Bresson. You know, so He's still alive. He's still alive at 94. and just, I just that? had 
lunch with him about three, day, three weeks ago, and he's, he's remarkable. And they're getting ready to do a huge retrospective on him, who was also powerful during the same time yeah. in France in terms of what he was doing. Wonderful. Artistically. Um, you, you, you believe the interviewer is the enemy of mystery. Um. Uh, yeah, I do believe that, but not as strongly as J J J Jasper Johns uh, seems to believe it. He really believes it. Um, no, no, I think Jasper Johns is simply a shy person. I don't, I don't yes. think it's because he objects to the process. I think he's shy. And who might say that his painting has done his talking for no, him. They all say that. Oh, yeah. they all say that. Um, I think an interviewer wants to get at the, uh, the human core of the artist, and a lot of his endeavor is to turn that core into something else. So. And I'm, I feel that too, as a reader, I'm interested to know what what Stephen King is really like, yeah. <laughs> or what he really thinks, what is he trying to, t and all yeah. that. But, but, but the artist is trying to defend, is, defend this castle that yeah, you've made. Here is my argument on my behalf, and and you have been gracious with me, and 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 we've had discussions about every aspect of life, whether it's scoff or sexuality or relationships the two or divorce. Key things. Yeah. Yeah, two things for us. Yeah. Um, here is, it is. If you are a, if you are a conductor, what you want to know from the score is what was Brahms' intention. What was he doing, or Bach, or anyone else? Why isn't that a legitimate inquiry for me? Uh, maybe because you're not a conductor. Uh, conductor needs to know. He needs to in, to to inhabit the mind. Well, maybe of I'm the, defining John Updike by doing this. Yeah. I think you're maybe. entitled. You and the public behind you are entitled to ask any questions you want. You mustn't be disappointed if the artists don't have the answers or give not your answers. Uh, it's a strange thing why some people are led to think they can create art. Uh, what irritation leads us into this delusion, I don't quite know. But uh, it is, somehow it's just not enough to say, I believe so and so. Um, yeah. You want to construct another world. Uh, That's an interesting. Irritation creates art. Often, yeah. I think so. Yeah, irritation. Something you can't do any other way, like, Maybe I don't speak very well, but I, when I sit down and write, I can make it come smooth, that kind of thing. Um. This book is called Seek My Face, uh, John Updike. He is, a, at this conversation, a delight as he has been at every conversation. Thank you for coming. Thank you, sir.